Joe, suppose straight to it. Um, where, where are you from? I'm doing my own uh, YouTube channel or game. Really? Yeah. Good what, man what yourself. What you making of? Brilliant. Yeah. Well. You'll be having naked UFC fights soon with your opponents. Well, that was the plan. Maybe GA as well. But uh, Joe, we get s- straight through it. You, you did an article for um, for the Irish News just to basically explain it. Or sorry, it was the Celtic Life. So which uh, which paper did you? Gaelic Life. Gaelic Life. I bet you don't even read the newspapers, do you? Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> straight in with the comments. Okay. Well, that's, you you were you were never going to work for a paid subscription TV yeah, service, yeah. and and now you're going in with air. Well, so I mean, the, I think you know the GA has rejected my arguments completely. You know, and it's clear that there's a whole new landscape now for viewers I mean I read the BBC Trust report recently with interest that the average age of a BBC One TV viewer now is 61 you know and my kids just wouldn't know what the fuss is you know it's all it's all YouTube online streaming you know getting a package with your phone and you know Conor McGregor all that stuff and I suppose increasingly you know, I, I was feeling that, that, you know, this stuff's, you're howling into the wilderness now. You know, it's not, you know, I mean, can, can you say to any of the Gaelic footballers who are here today, for example, or hurlers, you know, that there's a problem with the air or with the sky, they'd say, what the fuck are you talking about? Because it's clear there's going to be a whole new landscape and it's happening so quickly, you know. Um, so I think that, I've decided, I mean, and part of it ov- obviously is that I was, you know, very hurt about what happened with RT, and I don't want to leave it at that because I love the public conversation and the telly. And also I like opportunities, you know. If somebody asked me to do something, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'd i say yes like a parrot because you never know what you'll miss otherwise. Did you ever read The Great Gatsby? You know, the narrator in The Great Gatsby, looking longingly across the bridge as the car full of people flying past on their way clearly to a party and he's thinking fuck I wish I was with them you know and there's a part of me like that you know that I don't want to miss opportunities and you know don't like to see around the corner just say yeah see what happens you know. and what about then the fact that it would come across a little bit hypocritical do you care about that well I mean that's fine you know I'm not the best person to judge that but I was surprised whenever they did contact me to learn that They've got like 600,000 viewers who watch subscribers who get the games for free with their mobile phone pack. It's just back to what I'm saying about, like on on Saturday I was down at Hope House, you know, the addiction centre in Foxford and Mayo, run by sisters Dolores and Attractor, who are both GA fanatics. And they, they set it up in September 1993. You'd be too young to remember that. It was a great month in the GA's history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Uh, you don't know what happened in September 1993, do you? Mm. Oh, oh, fuck, see. <laughs> some people. Some fucking people. But they were delighted because they've got air through their mobile phone package. And during our meeting, they spent about a half an hour of it listening to Midwest on their mobile phones, their coverage of the Junior All-Ireland semi-final between Kilmeen and Mayo and Nagel and Kerry and you know it just it brings home the fact that this is a whole new broadcasting landscape now everything's different I mean the GA's got its own subscription TV service now through GA Go and I've been I'm the patron of the Mayor Roscommon Hospice and so I've been involved for the last three years travelling the globe fundraising for the first Mayo Hospice which was opened in September past and now we started the Roscommon Hospice on Friday. And through that global journey, you know, I've met GA people in communities all over the world. And GA goes an absolute lifeline for them. And it costs 10 euro a game. You know, and the real game for the GA should be to have its own service. You know, I've been advocating this for a long time. GA needs to take control of all TV. And so that the money that comes in goes into the GA's coffers. You know, the GA runs it and controls it then. I mean, why should the GA use any broadcaster? So, and that's something that's in their think tank. You know, and as I say to you, it's all going to change. And I like the public conversation. It's important also for the evangelizing that I do in other areas, like cystic fibrosis, all those sorts of things. You know, and you don't, 
you know, I really don't want to be... I think also without the telly, you know, that your influence would diminish and diminish and diminish. You know? It's all very well having a newspaper column, The Independent, but nothing beats the immediacy of the debate and the, the fun, you know. So you've changed your view entirely. Is well, that you know, I mean, obviously I, 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 I got, you know, I got the, the hatchet and RT, which for me was very shocking, you know. Um, I was told by the head of sport that it was unforgivable and unprofessional that I said to Pat Spillane at 11 minutes past three in the drawing game, would you stop pulling my arm? I said, like, are you serious? Is this, like, have you lost your mad marbles? No, no, he said, that can't be tolerated. Your contract will not be renewed. And, you'll, you know, and you know, I mean, there was clearly a personal thing there, and that had been, I had felt that from the moment the new head of sport had come in. You know, all of a sudden we were being micromanaged. You know, it was all about statistics. You know, I never saw the previous heads of sport. You might get a text in the Monday morning saying that was terrific telly or something, but never saw them. But it became very micromanaged and very, um, you know, risk averse. I mean, I was being told you can't say that and don't talk about that. And you know, for the other and final, like we got a, I got a script, an emailed script. I was shown the print journalists. You know, I took some screenshots of it just so that it wouldn't doubt my own sanity. You say this and say this, and then your video package will be this and this. I said, I rang up and said, look, you need a newsreader, you need a narrator. You don't yeah, want so that's, your, that's your issue with RT. Have you changed your view on what you'd previously said about well, subscription-based? I, I, I mean, the argument has been lost. You know, I'm a GA man, and the GA is a democracy. And it's like, I'm very pally with Jarlath Burns, for example, who's going to be the next GA president. He said, look, this is done. This is set in stone. You know, this is never changing. And Congress has had three or four very half-hearted attempts to try and change the situation, all being emphatically rejected. You know, so, I mean, I'm a lone voice, really. And, you know, it's going nowhere, it's dead. You know, so it becomes, it becomes pointless. It becomes pointless. Like, the argument's lost. And I mean, my children, for example, just said, what are you, what are you talking about, you know? Yeah, but would you have changed your view had this opportunity not come up? Well, I have to say, it's hard to say, you see, because I was very annoyed about the RT thing, and I, ha I didn't expect a call from these people, and when I got the call, I was like, you know, great, you know. That was my instinctive reaction. I said, okay, look, I'll meet you with an open mind. I said, like, you know, I said, just want you to keep an open mind on it. But when I met them and all, they, you know, they said, look, we guarantee free speech, you can... You do what you do, you know, there'll be no editorial intrusion in that. You'll be independent, you'll be able to speak your mind. And then I was also attracted to, which I wasn't aware of at all, that they had so many subscribers who were watching the games for free. So, I mean, obviously it's been a... Because, you know, whenever I was in that ivory tower of RT, you didn't really consider any of these things at all, you know. And... Um, so, for, I have to say, I was... When I met them, I felt excited, you know, and I got that old feeling of, I, mean, I have to say, I love the telly. Like, I mean, whenever you're sitting in there and they say, I can feel the, oh, yeah, but you talk about this is going to be fun. The changes that you've seen in RT mm. in terms of basically censorship, I suppose, and what oh, you yes, can say. Oh, yes, absolute so censorship. Are you not afraid, entirely that, are you not afraid that this is a TV-wide issue? And going I'm only doing four now. I'll do four. I'm doing four live shows, and that'll, you know, but I've been guaranteed, and I've no doubt to... To, I mean, I think also the ironic thing is that young people now want edgy discussion, edgy debate. You know, the younger generation, and the younger generation will be lost to the, this heavy statistical discussion because one of the one of the, the problems for young pundits now who have come out of the game is that they've been in that culture of secrecy throughout their adult playing life where nobody says anything, and you get used to speaking without saying anything, and. It's a very easy thing then to just become statistics driven. So, you know, a, st a statistician was brought in, and I mean, I became like a politician being directed by a spin guru. I mean, your phone, your f the, your phone would just be going like zzz, 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 with these stats coming in from a laptop, saying, you know, "Read this out, read this out." Cork's productivity levels twenty three percent. You know, say that. Saying, You're like, "Fuck," you know, you haven't even reached half time yet, and there's maybe twenty. WhatsApp messages from the head of sport, you know, who dominated the WhatsApp group. And, uh, you know, I was given the analogy to, 
can't remember which of the journalists it was. It was like, these people are all too old to remember Colombo. Colombo. It was like being, you know, the, the, the murderer being hounded by Colombo. You know, I mean, I turned around and there he was, like, and it was a constant, constant, constant thing. And, but even even at that, I was still surprised at the end because I thought we had a brilliant drawn all Ireland final. It was great fun. I had a blast at, at David Goff, who's a good pal of mine, about the Kerry propaganda. You know, after the penalty was given, I you know because you could feel it in the stadium. It was something different happening. And uh, you know, you when you're in live telly, you maybe get five six minutes through a whole live broadcast. People think it's a lot longer, but it's not. So you've got to hone it down and. Pitch it, you know, create the debate. That's all you can do is create the debate. And I mean, it was such a lively debate there, you see, because I went for golf, you know. And uh, on the Monday, then I got these messages when I came out of court from Radio Kerry saying, would you come on Radio Kerry to defend your outrageous remarks, you see. So I said, oh, absolutely, definitely. So I was on Radio Kerry on the Monday night, and it was tremendous fun, you know, getting dogs abused. And it was, you know, it was just perfect. You know, GA, what you would have a debate if you, if you had a Dublin supporter and a Kerry supporter in a bar, you know, in good nature, debating the game. Because if there's any point in punditry, it's that you speak your mind and that you enjoy the debate that comes out. Whether you're right or wrong is not really particularly relevant. We're not discussing pedof- pedophilia or, you know, you know, world hunger. We're talking about yellow cards, you know, red cards, a penalty, not a penalty. Sense, you know, like it's fun. It's our recreation and our amusement. And for me, what RT have, what what has happened with the new head of sport is that it's become very narrow focused on statistics, on banality, on safety, on not saying anything. You know, making sure there are no letters of complaint in. Just keep it completely safe and completely conservative. You know, well, that's and not be uh, this time. is that something you've spoke about? You know, yeah, well, I mean, it's the first thing we discussed. I said, like, you know, I would be interested, subject to being able to speak my mind. Because what's the point of it? I mean, it's only football punditry. Like, you could talk, we could all talk about it. The way I see football punditry is simple. If I'm in the bar with a few pals of mine who are knowledgeable about Gaelic football and we're talking about the game, letting the dice fall where they may, well, if that's your mindset, then you're in business, you know. And you see that, for example, with the NBA coverage, which I think is peerless. You know, it's about that false friendship where that you've got guys who are very personable, you know, who are enjoying the game, enjoying the personalities, enjoying the fun, sidetracking to what's interesting. And statistics come up in a box in the corner. I suggested that for RT, you know. It's like, it's, this is too, you know, it's too dull. Kids are not going to be interested in this. You know, a mother sitting where kids watching the game looking for the debate and the fun at half time. They're gonna switch off. You know, the elderly farmer, he's like, fuck. He's a fuck about Kerry's productivity rating in the second quarter. You know, nobody cares. Of course, statistics can be helpful. They can inform your narrative, but that's it. You know, it's different for a manager of a team. You know. But this was, we were like, you know, pupils with the headmaster or I think a better analogy would be newsreaders in the newsroom. We were reduced to reading out, in essence, what was there for us. And, you know, where's the fun in that? I mean, I had a blast in RT, don't get me wrong. Did wrong. You, 20 uh, years. You like. mentioned your annoyance with them. Were you annoyed that they kept you in that documentary they did at the end for the 40 years? Or were you I just was happy different. to let that go? That, that was a different you thing. You know, I didn't watch it. I didn't watch it because it was, you know, I was hurt. Because... I filmed that documentary. Yeah. The part that I did was the day before the drawing game. I had no inkling of what was coming, but it was clearly going to come. And what was used was a pretext, you know. Mm-hmm. Send to Pat's plan, like, don't pull me arm. I mean, after me and Pat are like an unmarried couple, you know. I told Pat afterwards, he said, you're, you're pulling my leg. He said, you're joking. I said, no. And I don't know if you recall at the end of the broadcast while we were still live, I congratulated Pat very warmly, you know, with hands on him about his nephews superb cameo at the end of the game. Said so you must be very proud. You know. And that would resonate with GA people all around the world. You know, because you know you learn when you're there as long as I am, the connection. What you know, what's what sort of reaction will be created. Like I'd visit maybe 35, 40 GA clubs a year. And I do that no expense, no fee. You know, I have very strong 
views on community and the strength of community and the neglect of the GA in that regard, or s the social importance of the GA, the political importance of the GA, it's all completely neglected. We don't even have a lobbyist in the Doyle, the biggest community organisation in the country. You know, and you look at the neglect of small clubs all around the country, you know, <coughs> the, the fact that the fundamental things that are needed to restore the health of the GA, none of them are being done. So club players associations proposals were completely rejected. You know. And instead of condensing the county season so that boys have a life and they can go back and play for their clubs, you know, and have a healthy, balanced life. You know, we continue to go down this ridiculous road where we know that only Dublin, Kerry, maybe Tron in the football, a few teams in the hurling can win in all Ireland. Yet we've got Leitrim training five days a week and spending three hundred thousand a year on their preparations. It's completely insane, you know. And these fundamental things that need to be changed, you know, none of them are being properly looked at. Joe, what about Colm and Pat? Would you still tune in to watch them then in the summer? Can they still provide <laughs> interesting analysis? Well, you see, Colm's on the chopping block as well because he's got a strong, he's got strong opinions. He's a man's man, you know. He refuses to lick arse. And, you know, you see that in the WhatsApp group, it's hilarious. You see the boys here, they are slickers, you know, it's all like, oh, great point, Declan, you know, to the head of sport, oh, that's a great point, oh, that's a brilliant point, oh, thanks for that, you know, I'll, I'll show you some of the screenshots, it's hilarious stuff. And then, you know, I would have, every now and again, I would have said, you know, say you'd get a, <laughs> you might get a WhatsApp saying, oh, Kearney's forwards have, you know, really approved at the start of the second half. I would say another news, bear shits and woods, maybe something like off the crack, you know. This, this stuff, sort of stuff went down like a lead balloon. So I stopped putting anything into it at all. And it would be wrong to give the impression that I wasn't, you know, I mean, I do a lot of preparation for the games, you know, and in the video analysis and I'm at Keenan spotting trends and, you know, um, I'm interested in the intricacies of the game because I'm, you know, manage in the club at underage level. I'm taking the minors now for the third year. So I'm very interested in anything you can pick up and the wee tricks and the nuances and all of that. But in the end, it's about entertainment. That's what it is in the end. Do so does the coverage need a, a Brawley, a Dunphy, a George Hook? Does it need a character like that to make an interest? Well, I don't know. I'm not the best person to judge. But I do know that I had a blast. We had great viewing figures. And, you know, it was part of the public conversation. And wherever you went, people talked to you about it. You know, and... And... You know, so it was a big... You know, it was really a kick in the stomach whenever it happened to me. Because you just... I, look, I know you think... That I suppose after 20 years you think that you're sort of invincible in there and but I was so comfortable with it all and how it all worked and you know and also you know the sort of the manipulation of public opinion as well which can be a lot of fun you know you know you're setting x against y just by you know you're doing it just to throw in a hand grenade every now and again and to <coughs> it was a lot of fun and it was only football it wasn't serious in the end even the conditions you play were developing at RD, do you think you would have stayed around for much longer anyway? No, it, it was definitely coming to me because I was just being hemmed in and hemmed in and hemmed in. You know. I mean, you were asking about Colm. I don't think Colm will be. Like, for the replay this year, and again, what a kick in the teeth for him after 30 years. You know, instead of him being brought in then, whatever reasons that he wasn't there in the first place, you know, to bring in Stephen Rochford, you know, it just typifies the banality, the blandness, the control and culture that's there. Now, you know, you bring in a safe guy, you're not going to say anything. You can go through statistics, you know. Who gives a fuck, realistically? Who gives a fuck? Who talked about it afterwards? Who said, Jesus, did you hear that yesterday? That was such fun. You know, I disagree with that, I have to say. That's the essence of it. You know, punditry is not an important thing, I think you'll all agree with me, in society. But it, if it is any importance at all, it's that you speak your mind. Freedom of expression. That's the point of it. And increasingly what you're getting is a controlled, robotic approach where ex expressing the view is, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. And before that, with the previous heads of sport, I was told, the stage is yours, that's why you're here. That's why you're here. You know, Don't defend against the laws of libel, which I never did. But Joe, if you believe in a socialist kind of idea for... The GA, how does that tally with working for a TV station like Air? Like, because there's a lot of people who don't have Air that won't be able to see yeah. what you're going to do. Well, I'm sorry to labour the point, but it's just you were so against yeah. this. Well, you know, I, I come back to the point that the argument has been lost. The GA is never going to change. 
I can either say, well, look, that's it. And you think in five years' time, like, we have a process of normalization now. Ten years. Ten years now. And I remember at the time people saying, oh, this is only be a short-lived experiment. The short-lived experiment. Money talks, and that's what's happening. This, this is not a short-lived experience. This is set in stone. And you go back a generation, from my generation, people are saying, what are you talking about? You know, no one's interested. No one cares. You know, I mean, your whole, your whole output's on YouTube. Yeah, you think he cares. You know, and the reality is that young people don't. I mean, there's been a collapse in the TV viewing audience in Ireland. In two years, the 15 to 25-year-old bracket has collapsed by 25%. They're watching TV at all. They'll watch streaming. You know, they'll get a mobile phone package. They'll watch Sky on their phone. Then when they get the Sky, Sky Go, Sky Mobile, they'll watch Air on the phone. You know, we've seen what's happened with sports all over the world. And eventually, you know, you're a Luddite. You sound like a, you know, let's smash up the computers. You become irrelevant. The argument's lost, that's it. You move on, accept it. Is that a recent realisation for you? Or you that's how well, you see, you, ha you know, you come to the realisation. <laughs> you know, you have the, you have the, I suppose, the comparative, you know, the, the, when you were in RT, you wouldn't have, you didn't have to think about it, really. But, there's no doubt, like... You thought that you wouldn't work for Sky or Air. Well, you know, there you are, then I'm a hypocrite. You know, I think that the... Uh, there are far more important debates in the GAA, and there's clearly going to be a separation of county and club now as things are going. You know, my real sort of loyalty is to club and community. You know, I view this as fun, you know, as a, you know, it's a distraction. It's great. And I love Saturday Night Football too, you know. Yeah, and, uh, and... Because of the injustice for the league. Like, if you were, if an yeah. offer was to come around, would you like to work for the championship, say for Sky Sports, would that, would that interest you? Oh, that would put the... <laughs> that would be... <laughs> that would be the kind of one I bet you. Yeah, yeah. Like, maybe if, if, <coughs> if, because I'm, you know, I'm... Maybe if, for example, they were agreeable to putting Sky Sports free into the hospitals. You know, that's a big thing for me because I obviously spend a lot of time in the hospitals through the CF and the organ donation stuff. You know, but there would have to be something like that. You know, and I, and I don't see any reason that that shouldn't be done because the most vulnerable people in the community are the ones who are not going to see the games. I mean, everybody else can see the games. That's the reality now. And... Um, But there would need to be something like that. Yes, there, um, you mentioned about all this and stony football, and there's bigger issues facing GA. In your eyes, what is the biggest issue facing GA? Is it the fixtures? Is it the separation of clubs? Is well, it the, 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 the biggest issue that will solve almost all of the problems, almost all of the problems will retreat, is to condense the county season. If you condense the county season to four months, which is long enough for the county season, Immediately, you're in business. So we see now that many county boards are on the verge of bankruptcy. Some of them, in truth, are bankrupt. Like Cork, they're bankrupt. Like Mayo are in a bad hole. You know, similar picture all over Ireland. Galway are in a bad place. Because we've concertinated, the GA has allowed a professional approach to be concertinated into an amateur sport. And county teams now are sucking in every penny of fundraising that there is in the county. You know, they're, they're, they're just a black hole and clubs are left, you know, to fend for themselves. The county board's primary duty is supposed to look after the health of the game in the county, the health of the GA communities there. They don't have time to do that anymore. You know, you've got amateur people who are doing their best. But like Mayo, for example, spent 1.2 million euro on their senior team last year. You know, 1.2 million euro. They don't have that money. But Derry spent half a million, Derry, in Division 4 of the National League. You know, So that's the biggest problem. So you reduce that to four months, all of a sudden, boys of county players have a balanced life. County players can play for their clubs. This is a huge issue. Whenever I was playing for Dungiven, all our county men played for Dungiven. So the, the whole town was at our home league games every week, and they were an event. Now you go to see Dungiven play, and there's 20 people there, 25 people there, because county players aren't there. You, know, you don't see the best players anymore. You know, the clubs are left to fend for themselves, and it's okay in Dublin 
where they've got resources, where they have a brilliant coaching strategy, you know, where they've got a CEO who's peerless, who should be running the GAA. But in the rest of Ireland, you're being left to fend for yourself, and it's all falling apart. So you're just a county season of four months. Then a guy from Leitrim will say, all right, I'll give the county season a crack for four months. You know, I'll go out, look, we're not going around all Ireland, but it's not all encompassing, and it's not, take, it's not obliterating the rest of my life. Plus, I can play for the club then. You know, I can have an off-season, I can have a summer holiday. You know, so expense-wise, it shrinks the county board's expenses by probably 60% on the county senior team, freeing up all those funds. And, you know, creating a situation where people say, look, it's OK, I don't mind playing in an All-Ireland Championship that I know the, championship that I know the Dubs are going to win anyway, or possibly carry. You know, we'll get a few rounds out of it. You know, we'll have a crack. Which used to be the situation. You know, everybody went out and had a crack at it. But now what you see in the modern system is that the vast majority of teams at county level are just going through the motions. They go out, they know what they're going to do, they're going to lose, they'll go through the motions. It's awfully dull for spectators. So in turn, instead of Pat Gilroy's idea, which was a festival of football during the summer, whenever he applied to be the director general, whenever Park Duffy got it, and Pat was the CEO of a company that had maybe 10,000 employees. He was a visionary, and he said, look, let's bring the county season down to four months maximum. We'll have a festival of football in the summer, four tiers. You know, the league will, 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 will sort of mix with the championship, and that's it. Apart from that, every player is a club player. That's their primary duty, and we'll put that in rule. We'll save a fortune. You know, we'll restore the health of the game. That'll create real well-being, not the sort of lip service that's paid to. But they ran a mile from that. That was, that was a great idea. You'd miss the spotlight if you weren't on TV, but it sounds about absolutely. <laughs> what is it about? Is it ad addictive? I'm not on YouTube, though. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna fight you on YouTube naked. <laughs> fine, yeah. fine place to end it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Corp in this weekend, you're obviously a big, big fan. You've got that public guy. Do you think they'll do the first three in a row? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. The well, they're playing a game that no one else is playing. Yeah. So on top of all their systems, on top of the you know, 30 years of creative thinking that have gone into that team. They've also got the entire skill set. I mean, the way they worked that goal against Ballantubber to flush out the blank, to tease out the blanket defence and then kick the, kick the ball over the top to Silk. I mean, it was so rehearsed and planned and a thing of beauty. I've not seen anything like it. I've not seen anything like the way they solve problems on the field. Um, their, their movement off the ball, their you try to coach a team looks not about the first pass it's about the second pass or possibly even the third pass you know it's about your position and being aware of where you are in the field I mean you'll see those guys backpedaling away rotating around you'll see them deciding to go to, to go together to a set point I mean for example their first goal against Nemo Rangers as soon as they got the sideline kick at right half back the right half forward sprinted towards the kicker brought his man out of there left the hole the ball was kicked over the top to the man who's now running into that space. He drops it off to Sice and then Sice kicks it to the corner flag to the two-man two, fo two full forward line who've sprinted towards the corner flag together. And as soon as it's going to man A rather than man B, man B sees that and he wheels away and heads for goal. It's kicked over the top to him. 11, 11 seconds, 20 seconds and the ball's in the net. And Nemo Rangers are beaten already because they've suffered so badly at their hands three years earlier in Coke Park. Better so it's. A, a I think they're a better team than Cross. Than they're more controlled. Cross or played. Cross, cross played an absolutely vibrant. You're talking about the 2010, yeah. 2011. Cross, they were so vibrant. But I've not seen anything more ingenious than Cora Finn. And even defensively, their work's ingenious. And. Um, you know, they concede fewer scores than any other team. And they play such beautiful football. It's so easy on the eye. I mean, you've got to laugh at their audacity. And they're a nightmare in Croke Park. Yeah. You know, because there's a true playing surface. And, you know, if you're going to catch them, I think you have to catch them before Croke Park. I mean, their last three All-Ireland Finals in Croke Park, I mean, they've been hilarious, but they've been humiliations for the opposition. I mean, against really good teams. Everybody's like, what the fuck? Could you make any case for Kilcoon? 
Well, I mean, they're very, they're, they're organized and they're very passionate. And, you know, they're a very small, very tightly knit, bad tempered community in the heart of the Mourns. You know, and they will fuck you up. Mm. You know, seriously. And they will trash talk you and they will hit you. And they, 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 are, they are very loyal to each other and there's a great sense of unity. Um, you know, and they've done tremendously well to get to this stage, but this is a different type of thing that Cora Finn are doing. I mean, something extraordinary would have to happen. Uh, Kilku are more seasoned than, and more organized than Nemo Rangers. You know, they're, they're, they're a lot more seasoned and organized than Crooks, you know, who Cora Finn annihilated last year. But it's so difficult to see how you can stifle that creativity for 60 minutes. It'd be a good Division 2 team at, at a minimum, Corfin. I think they'd be a very good Division 1 team. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the, the thing about a team is that it's, 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 it's the... You ask yourself, well, well, as a group, how good are they? You never say, look, how good are the individuals? So you watch the dubs. It's about the group. Mm. You know, it's about that deep down feeling that whenever there's adversity in a game, which is the real key to any great team, that we will automatically almost deep down sense that and we then work together to make sure that we're not defeated. And everybody rises to the occasion. And you see that, like last year's drawn All-Ireland final when Kerry looked all ends up to go on and finish it. For the last 10 minutes, Kerry didn't score. Dublin weren't playing well, but there's no way Dublin were going to be beaten. And to go into the changing room afterwards, that Dublin team, and they've done it so many times. That's the real joy. It's not the actual winning of the game and winning titles or anything. It's that sense of knowing, look, you know, we, um, we have a unity that's unbreakable. You know, we have a unity and a spirit deep down that, that emerges, that emerges uh, whenever we most need that to emerge. And that's the thing about Cora Finn. You see them, and people have thrown all sorts at them. I mean, Gidor put them to the pin of their collar in the All-Ireland semi-final last year, and yet they punctured them with the goals, you know. Just and it's all, it's all just part and parcel of what they do. For them, it's not a big deal. Joe, when you talk about counties having a crack at us, back in your day, having a crack at the championship, yeah. is, is the second-tier championship, is that anything that a county like Derry might have a crack at? Or does yeah, it but the second-tier championship would be good if the county season was condensed. You know, it was all done our ways. What they should have done was do the fixtures report, condense the county season, restore the primacy of the club game, and then you would you would reinvigorate the game. But as it is, I'm, I'm saying to you, we're now playing, we're now seeing the era of going through the motions football. Where there's a load of teams who'll do all the training, they'll do that, but in truth, they're not going out to have a go. They're just going through the motions. You know, and it's an awful shame. Like I see it in my own county, like where we're going out to play Tyrone, and there's a they're just they're playing a formulaic brand of football that's doomed to failure. You know, keep the scores down. Like, what's the point of that? But in terms of a, a set, like, I mean, would you be happy for Derry to win the second tier? Yeah, this I mean, year? the second tier is great, but so only so long as it's part of a vibrant overall package. And the problem is that they've 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 put it in now. They're not going to give it proper respect. They should have said, look, the final will be played in the same day as the All Ireland final. You know, they've tucked it away in. I think it's July. In Croke Park on the same day as the quarter final, you know, fucking ask the boys from Armagh to come in and be treated as lesser than their, you know, than the lads who are playing in the quarter final. Like I was, I was there. I was with Antrim when we won, when we won the Tommy Murphy Cup, or the boys christened it the Tommy Cooper Cup, because it was so poorly, it was so <coughs> poorly treated by the GA, and they wouldn't even let the Antrim team bus in underneath the Hogan stand. We all had to get out of the bus out there, and then they put us in one of the juvenile changing rooms. You know, you got it for fuck's sake. Like, no, it was a great game. But I mean, Mick O'Dwyer, who was the Wicklow manager at the time, he refused to come. <laughs> so you're like, Kevin O'Brien was the manager. Hi, hey, Kevin. <laughs> Hi, Joe. And, you know, they treated it with no respect. And the boys got no perks from it or anything. And they were very much, you know, like, and I fear that that's what will happen with this second year tournament already. You know, you're seeing this. You know, and again, I come back to the whole nature of the GA. If you want it to work properly and want it to work the way that it used to work, where there'd be shocks and upsets and everybody would out and give it their all, 
you've got to, to reduce the season because it's just become too professional and mechanical. And in that sort of era, in an era of professionalism, well, obviously the dubs are going to dominate, you know, because it's a numbers game at the end. Steve Pierce in the inter-county game as, as a whole, not absolutely. just Absolutely, absolutely. Like your own son played for Antrim Miners, was it two seasons ago? He obviously yeah, had ambitions to go on. Yeah, would well, you he's be the captain of the under-20s now, the no, but they have a good team. But would you be fearful that when he goes on and hopefully plays for Antrim Seniors that he won't have the same experience of what inter-county football is than, than what his dad did growing up? Well, I mean, he's obviously not going to... I mean, I played on a great team. Yeah. And it was a once-in-a-generation thing from a county that's got a, a tremendous tradition of Gaelic football. And, um, you know, we weren't going through the motions. But the real, you know, you said Derry now at the moment with Rory Gallagher, that's going through the motions football. You know, everything's preordained and formulaic. You know, it's about keeping the scores down and competing, you know, which of course has the entire opposite effect. I mean, keeping the score, score it's down football. What, the whole point of the game is to win. And that's what, that's what, has been missed in the coaching orthodoxy that we see that has grown up since Jimmy McGuinness, which entirely mistook what Jimmy was doing. But that coaching orthodoxy creates teams and players who are simply going through the motions, who feel powerless when they go out to play for their team. You know, because you can't go, you can't go with the flow. You can't go with. I mean, um, Eddie Brennan, the great Kilkenny corner forward. I think he's good at all Ireland. He always said that about that great Kilkenny team because we were trusted to play the game. Whenever we felt momentum, boom, everybody was on it like a flash. And then it was a tidal wave all over you. You know, and we saw what they, their destructive power when they played, they played like they went for it. The point of the game is to win. And that's what been, what's been missed in the coaching orthodoxies that now dominate the game. When a version of Gaelic football is built like the Mount Carl Finn play as exists, do, do we need something that's going to change the game like the, the Ant Mark? No, I agree with you totally. I mean, that's the answer to, you know, what's the real problem in the game? The real problem in the game is the sweeper who comes and stands in front of the full forward. That's the real problem. Even the dubs do it now, after they were chastened by Donegal in the 2014 semi-final. So the guy comes and he stands there, right? So you got this old defender, right? And you see it in every underage game now, and sometimes they'll have two zonal defenders. That's the real problem. What's the solution to that problem? You know, I did a whole br blueprint for the rules committee when they were looking at this. Lisa, and it was always like, oh, there's too many hand passes in the game. No, that's a symptom. That's a symptom of the zonal defender. Because you look up and you can't kick the ball to the full forward. He's being double marked. So you want to move the ball. You know, you want to give, you know, and also then, you know, whenever you win the ball in a crowded defence, you're going to have to hand pass the ball because you're not in a position to attack because your half forwards have been withdrawn. But the real problem is the zonal defender. So I... There were, you know, we've got four inter-county refs, so one of the things that I proposed was, okay, look, instead of having two sideline, two highly trained inter-county refs deciding whether a ball's gone over the sideline, right, put a ref in each half of the pitch, right, and one of his roles is to, des to decide if there's a zonal defender. If someone's dropped off his man to drop into a space there, an immediate 21-yard free in, right, you'll soon get rid of the zonal defender. That was an easy solution. I also suggested an exclusion area, 30 metres out, a D around the goals. And inside that exclusion area, you have to man mark. So the forwards decide when they go in or not go in. And you got, so if David Clifford goes in, his man goes in with him. But no one else can go and stand in front of them. You know. And again, that would be policed, one ref on each side. Or you could actually have an official use one of your umpires as your, to police that. Easy. So it stops zonal defence and you've got a man mark. Completely ignored, you know. Um, no back pass to the keeper, so that encourages the the forwards to go up on the the backs and man mark them. That's the most and obvious one, even. Like fuck me. So you watch the day that Mayo played Dublin in the All Ireland final out here. Everybody knew when David Clark fucking uh, you know missed the missed his kick and kicked it over the sideline with the Dubs a point up and three minutes to go. Dubs aren't going to give the ball back now. And Mayo tackled them like fuck. And what Bernard Brogan did was they they worked it back to Cluxton. Three, four passes, boom, back to Cluxton. Game over. Come on. Pan pass it over his head, give it back. Yeah, come on. Pan pass it over his head, give it back. You know, so no back pass to the keeper. What could be easier to police, even at club level? You know, 
and encourages the attacking team, the defensive team, the reformers, to push up. That was ignored as well. No back pass over the half forward line. So you must advance, you must keep going once you're in there. So if you must keep going when you're in there, then you've got to start thinking about giving the ball earlier. You know, a kick-out rule, the ball has to be kicked out long between the 45s, and only the four midfielders are allowed between the 45s until the ball's kicked. It means that automatically you can't drop back and be a sweeper. You know, and that a midfielder, almost always, when there's only going to be four there, your midfielder will get possession from the kick-out, and then you'll be in a position to move the ball forward without all that congestion that we see. None of those would have affected the basic skills of the game. And what did they come up with? We'll turn it into Aussie rules. You know, I mean, you could have fucking make this stuff up. You know, and they're making the biggest balls of this as they did of the black card. You know, which was a good idea, but look at the way they've policed cynical fouling in rugby. I mean, it's just not worth your while anymore. You commit a cynical foul in rugby, uh, you're fucking sin pinned. There's an average 10 points scored against you during the sin bid period. Look, the penalty try, you don't even have to take the conversion anymore. You know, so f don't fucking do it. You know, and the way they've rigorously policed those rules and turned rugby into a real spectacle to watch, which you wouldn't have believed 15 years ago. Meanwhile, look at us. You know, still dragging men down. Oh, it took one for the team. You know, a guy's threw on goal, he's pulled down, and you get a 21 yard free on a black card instead of a sentence off on a penalty. So, you know, I have argued for, since the black card was brought in, the, the black card is it's a mess, it doesn't work properly. Let's refine it and let's deal with the real problems. So a guy being pulled down when he's through on goal, take one for the team. No, you're off, it's a fucking red card. You'll be suspended for four weeks and it's a penalty. Right? That'll soon put it out in the seat. David Goff was arguing for this this week in, the inter in his interview in the Irish Times depriving an opponent of a clear point scoring opportunity. There you, there's your sin bin and a 21 yard free in front of the goals. You know, a, a deliberate pull down anywhere in the pitch, a 21 yard free in front of the goals. It'll soon, it'll soon get rid of the cynical fouling and it'll free the game up. But none of these things are considered. I mean, on the rules committee, half of them were oil hurling lads like, boys like Frank Murphy and that. You know, oh, there's too many hand passes. Fuck off. There's not too many hand passes. The great Kerry team of the golden years, one of the most attractive teams that we've ever seen playing Gaelic football. They applied the hand pass to beautiful effect. Hand passes isn't the problem. The problem is the zonal defender. But you know, Jesus. <laughs> Thanks for watching our game. Don't forget to like and share the videos. And if you're new to the channel, hit subscribe.